Okay. Welcome. Hey. I believe this is our first event uh, from the outside uh, here in uh, uh, Woosley Hall, or certainly in this room. So thank you so much for joining us. We just had the building dedication just uh, just last week. And uh, yeah, really, really glad you could uh, join us for our distinguished uh, speaker tonight. If I could just put in a quick plug, we've got another event coming up on um, November 30th with Nobel laureate uh, uh, Vernon Smith uh, from uh, Wichita native, so coming back to his hometown. So I've got a few flyers in the back of the room if you want to uh, grab one of those. Uh, but anyway, for, uh, for our event, uh, by the way, I'm Ted Bolema, the uh, director of the Institute for the Study of Economic Growth. And it's really an honor to partner with uh, Raul and the uh, Bastiat Society and also with James and the uh, Kansas Policy Institute uh, tonight. Uh, so great to have everybody, uh, uh, great to have everybody here and joining us. Uh, you know, we, we've, we're a group here uh, inside of the uh, uh, College of Business, uh, mostly in the economics department. We're, we're teaching some, you know, trying to present some free market principles and do sort of research that uh, has a has a real policy impact. So well, I'd love to tell you more about it if uh, anyone would like to talk to us about it. Anyway, let's, let's move on to uh, Raul, who is going to introduce our uh, guest speaker. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, we have a, pr a pretty nice turnout, and I guess it's pretty much based on the speaker that we have tonight. Uh, the Wichita chapter of the Bossy Society, we have about 35 members. What we do is we're out there trying to promote, uh, teach the business people, the lay people, the principles of individual liberty and free market, so we're better able to defend some of the positions that, you know, that we try to espouse in our day-to-day -day business and lives. If uh, you're interested in, in learning more about the Bostia Society or getting on our email list and you're not already on our list, uh, on the back table there, we have uh, a little form that you can just put your name and your email address on that and we'll uh, put you on the list so you'll learn more about our upcoming events. But uh, uh, tonight, we're, we're lucky to have uh, Jason Riley here as our speaker. Jason's on the editorial board and a writer at the Wall Street Journal. He's uh, one, of, one of his big areas of expertise is, is the history and bi biography of Thomas Sowell. But he talks about a lot of different topics that kind of relate to any uh, individual freedom policy and you know, free market economics using you know, uh, daily examples of what's going on in the real world today. Uh, uh, Jason is uh, an opinion columnist at the Wall Street Journal, where his column, Upward Mobility, has run since 2016. He's also a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and has provided a lot of television commentary with various different uh, outlets, news outlets. Uh, he's the author of uh, his, his latest book is called Maverick, a biography of Thomas Sowell. And uh, he, uh, a couple of his other books that he has written is uh, Let Them In, The Case for Open Borders, Please Stop Helping Us, Quote, How Liberals Make It Harder for Blacks to Succeed, and uh, False Black Power. Uh, he's written quite, quite a few commentaries that have been published in national papers. Anyway, without further ado, I'd like to have Jason come up. Everyone, uh, everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that, uh, for that addition. Uh, before the pandemic, I did a fair amount of speaking on college campuses uh, when they let me. Um, and so it, uh, it's very nice to be back, uh, back speaking uh, on college campuses. I don't, I don't take it for, for granted anymore. I don't think you can um, these days uh, at a time when our colleges and, and universities seem to be getting more and more intellectually intolerant. Um, uh, it's good to know that uh, places like, like this, um, Wichita State and programs like Bastiat and the, uh, the uh, Kansas Public Policy Group um, uh, understand the role of, of, of a college and the purpose of of higher education. Um, so, some of you may know that uh, a few years ago, the University of Chicago 
began sending out letters to incoming freshmen that explain uh, the school's commitment to academic freedom, how they don't support uh, trigger warnings or safe spaces or cancel invited speakers based on uh, the topics being controversial. Um, you know, that used to go without saying on a college campus. Now it needs to be stated explicitly in writing to incoming students, which I think says something about where we are today. I think that college ought to be a place where students are exposed to different points of view. Um, their sensibilities are challenged, where they learn to grapple with alternative perspectives and formulate coherent responses to those perspectives, where they learn the difference between a, a slogan and an argument. Um, on a lot of campuses, that's not happening, or at least it's not happening to the extent that it should be. Um, and kids are being pushed toward pre, uh, preconceived ideological conclusions on economics, on the environment, on race, and so forth rather than being taught how to analyze issues that allows uh, them to reach independent conclusions. Um, and I think even worse, students are being encouraged, being encouraged uh, to silence or cancel people they disagree with instead of debating them, uh, all of which I think makes places like uh, Wichita State and, and programs like this one, not only important, but essential in today's environment. And I'm very honored to, to be here. Uh, I thought I'd spend a few minutes talking about the economist Thomas Sowell, uh, someone who's had a huge influence on my own writings and why so much of his scholarship continues to be relevant to our public policy debates today. And when I was researching my biography, I kept coming across Sowell's own descriptions of scholars he admired. And I was struck by how well those descriptions often applied to Sowell himself. Uh, for example, after the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist whom uh, Sowell had studied under at the University of Chicago passed away, Tom wrote this. In a world of self-promoting academics, George Stigler epitomized a rare integrity as well as, as well as a rare intellect. He jumped on no bandwagon, beat no drum for causes, created no cult, did the work of a scholar and a teacher, both superbly, and found that sufficient. If you wanted to learn, and above all, if you wanted to learn how to think, how to avoid vague words and empty thoughts or maudlin sentiments that cloud over reality, then Stigler was your man. Or here's Tom describing another one of his mentors, Milton Friedman whom he also studied under at Chicago. Friedman, he said, was one of very few intellectuals with both genius and common sense. He could, he could express himself at the highest analytical levels to his fellow economists in academic publications and still write popular books that could be readily understood by people who knew nothing about economics. I'm hard pressed to come up with better ways than those to describe Thomas Sowell. When I think about his scholarship, whether the subject is economics or history or culture, race, political philosophy, what have you, that's what comes to mind. Intellectual integrity, analytical rigor, respect for evidence, skepticism toward the kind of fashionable thinking that comes and goes. And then there's the clarity, column after column, book after book, written in plain English for general public consumption. In 2020, at the age of 90, Seoul published book number 36. The title is Charter Schools and Their Enemies. I hope Tom's not done writing books, but if he is, you could hardly find a more suitable swan song for a publishing career that has now spanned six decades. Tom's first two books were directed at students of economics. But his third book, the semi-autobiographical Black Education, Myths and Tragedies, was published in 1972 and written for the general public. It grew out of a long article on college admissions standards for Black students that he wrote for the New York Times Magazine back in 1970, after leaving his teaching post at Cornell. And it begins with a recounting of his own education, first at segregated schools in North Carolina where he was born, and later at integrated schools in New York City's Harlem neighborhood where he was raised. 
Uh, the topic of education, both at the K through 12 level and at the college level is one that Sowell has returned to repeatedly in his books over the decades. And in the preface to Charter Schools and Their Enemies, he describes a conversation he had in the early 1970s with Irving Kristol, who was the editor of a quarterly called The Public Interest. When Kristol asked Tom what could be done to create high quality schools for blacks, Tom replied that such schools already existed. In fact, that they had existed for generations. Crystal asked Tom to write about these schools for his magazine. And a 1974 issue of The Public Interest featured a long essay by Tom on the history of all black Dunbar High School in Washington, which had not only outperformed its local white counterparts in DC, but had repeatedly equaled or exceeded national norms on standardized tests throughout the first half of the 20th century. Over an 85 year span, from 1870 to 1955, Tom wrote, most of Dunbar's graduates went on to college, even though most Americans, white or black, did not. Two years later in the same publication, he wrote a second article on successful black elementary and high schools located throughout the country. In a sense, today's public charter schools, which often have predominantly low income, black and Hispanic student bodies, are successors to the high achieving black schools that Tom researched more than 40 years ago. And as Tom points out, what's clear is that these charter schools are not simply doing a better job than traditional public schools with the same demographic groups. In many cases, inner city charter schools are outperforming uh, their peers in the wealthiest and whitest suburban school districts in the country. In New York City, for example, the success academy charter schools have effectively closed the academic achievement gap between black and white students. As Sol explains, the educational success of these charter schools undermines theories of genetic determinism. It undermines claims of cultural bias and tests. It undermines assertions that black students must be sitting next to white students in order to learn. It undermines the presumption that family income differences explain differences in education outcomes. It's clear that charter schools have such vocal and passionate enemies, not because they don't work, but because they do work. And therefore, they pose a threat to the education status quo. They threaten the current power structure of violence that allows the interest of adults who run public education to come before what's best for students. Schools stay open, the schools still provide good jobs for adults. Whether or not you're learning, secondary concern at best. But, but as Sol writes, schools exist for the education of children. They do not exist to provide ironclad jobs for teachers. They do not exist to provide billions of dollars in union dues for teachers' unions or to provide monopolies for education bureaucracies. And they certainly don't exist to provide a captive audience for indoctrinators. In recent years, uh, charter school skeptics have made headway. Limits have been placed on how many can open, where they can be located. Bill Clinton and Barack Obama both supported charter schools. That's and progressives today have moved sharply to the left on education more recently. And the rhetoric coming out of the Biden administration is far more skeptical of charters. All of which makes Sowell's book as timely as anything he's ever written. One of the reasons I wanted to write this biography is because so much of Tom's scholarship, not just on education, remains relevant to our policy debates today. We're still talking about economic inequality, affirmative action, social justice, critical race theory, slavery reparations, the efficacy of minimum wage laws, the pros and cons of immigration and so forth. Tom's writings have addressed all of these topics. Frankly, I find it depressing that so many people today know names like ta Coates and Ibram Kendi and Cole Hannah-Jones and Cornell West, but not Thomas Sowell. Sowell's scholarship runs circles around those individuals, maybe around all of them put together frankly. 
But it's not just the volume of his writings that surpasses those other individuals. It's also the range and the depth and the rigor of his analysis, which they don't close to matching. He anticipated many of their arguments decades ago and refuted them decades ago. In some cases before the people making them today were even born. To the extent that Sol is known, it's mostly for his writings on racial controversies, but most of his books are not on racial themes. And Sol would have distinguished himself as a first rate scholar, even if he'd never written a single word about race and ethnicity. Another reason I wanted to write the book was to showcase his writings in these other areas. Uh, Tom is an economist by training, specializing in the history of economic thought and ideas. But he's also a historian, a sociologist, a political philosopher, and a social theorist. One person described him as one of our great intellectual trespassers, someone unafraid to go wherever his talent takes him. Sowell says his favorite of his own books is one titled A Conflict of Visions. And if you want it inside his head, it's certainly the book I would recommend. It's a book about the history of ideas. He tries to explain what drives our theological disputes about freedom, equality, and justice, and so forth. And he traces these disputes back at least two centuries to thinkers like William Godwin and Immanuel Kant and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, down through John Rawls and the social justice advocates of today. The conflicting or contrasting visions he describes in the book are the constrained or tragic view of human nature and the unconstrained or more utopian view. People with a more constrained view of the human condition see mankind as hopelessly flawed. They see inherent limits to human betterment. We may wanna end war, poverty or for example, but that's probably not going to happen. Therefore, our focus should be on putting in place institutions and processes that help us society deal with problems we're probably never gonna solve entirely. On the other side, you have this unconstrained or more utopian view of human nature, which basically rejects the idea that there are limits to what humans can achieve. This is the belief that nothing is unattainable and moreover, no trade-offs are necessary. Everything is available to all who want it. According to this perspective, through the pro proper amount of reason and willpower, we can not only manage problems like inequality and racism, but solve them entirely. In a conflict of visions, Sol argues that depending on which view you embrace, there are a whole host of public policies you're likely to support or oppose. The book explains why two people, similarly well-informed, similarly well-meaning, will reach opposite conclusions, not just on a given issue, but on a whole range of issues, taxes, rent control, school choice, military spending, judicial activism, and so forth. When Immanuel Kant said, from the crooked timber of humanity, no truly straight thing can ever be made, he was exhibiting the constrained view. But when Rousseau said, man is born free, but everywhere in chains, he was voicing the unconstrained view. When Oliver Wendell Holmes said that his job as a justice was to make sure the game is played according to the rules, whether he liked them or not. It was the constrained view. But when Earl Warren said that his job as a justice was to do what he thinks is right, regardless of the law, it was the unconstrained view. This is the philosophical framework, the, the template, so to speak, that explains Sowell's writings on almost any topic, economics and migration, to education, race, culture, and so forth. And if you really wanna understand where he's coming from, this is the book where he lays it out. Last year, Sol was awarded something called the Hayek Prize. It's named, of course, after the influential Austrian economist and political philosopher, Friedrich Hayek. Because of the pandemic, Sol couldn't travel and I was asked to accept the award on his behalf. And in my remarks, 
I said that one of the nice things about Thomas Sowell receiving that year's Hayek Award is that we know with a pretty high degree of certainty that Hayek himself would have approved of the choice. In fact, Hayek might have said, what took you guys so long? And that's because Sowell was not only a student of Hayek's work, but also an actual student of Friedrich Hayek in the early 1960s at the University of Chicago. Sowell wrote a paper about the French economist Jean-Baptiste Say for Hayek's class on the history of ideas. And the paper received very high praise from Hayek and was later published in an academic journal. And Hayek would later publicly praise Sowell's 1980 book on social theory titled Knowledge and Decisions. And he praised it in the most flattering terms possible. Hayek wrote a review of the book in Reason Magazine, my favorite part of the review is the beginning, where Hayek describes how when he first received a copy of the book, he put it aside because he was too busy with his own research to read it. Later, when he finally did get around to the book, he said, Hayek said he regretted having put it aside because he said he would have made much faster progress on his own research if he had stopped and read Tom's book first. Later in the review, Hayek calls knowledge and decisions an original achievement that broadened the application of Hayek's own scholarship and quote, effectively carried the approach into new fields that I had never even considered. Now keep in mind that Friedrich Hayek was already Friedrich Hayek when he wrote that. He'd already published Road to Serfdom. He'd already won his Nobel Prize and already was considered one of the greatest economists of the 20th century. My point is that even if Sowell had never written a single word about racial preferences, his body of work in other areas would be worthy of our attention. Beginning in the 1970s, Sowell did turn his attention to these racial controversies. He did so, he says, out of a sense of duty. He said there were things that needed to be said and too few others that were willing to say them, at least say them out loud. Tom's criticisms of the direction of the civil rights movement at the time eventually got him canceled, to use today's term. Black elites in particular wanted nothing to do with him because he opposed affirmative action. And they convinced others, particularly in the mainstream media, not to take Tom's view seriously, not to turn to him for a black point of view on racial controversies of the day. Sowell has long argued that the problems Blacks face today involve far more than what whites have done to them in the past. It's no mystery why Black activists want to keep the focus on racism. It helps them raise money, helps them stay relevant. And it's no mystery why politicians use the same tactics, helps them win votes. But Sowell's argued that it's not at all clear that a laser focus on white racism is helping the Black underclass. You can spend all day pointing out the moral failings of other people, other groups, institutions, society in general, and so forth, he's, he's written. Question is whether doing so helps the people who most need help. Activists go about their business with the assumption that the only real problem facing black, the black underclass is white racism. A good example of this is the recent focus on policing in black communities. Do racist cops exist? Absolutely. Do some cops abuse their authority? Of course. But are poor black communities so violent because of racist cops and police brutality? And will reducing police resources improve the situation? According to the Chicago Sun-Times, there were 492 homicides in Chicago in 2019. Do you know how many of them involved the police? Three. Three out of 492. If Chicago has a police problem, it's clearly a secondary problem. Chicago's bigger problem is crime. During one weekend in Chicago a few years ago, 74 people were shot. One of the local hospital emergency rooms had to shut down, turn away ambulances because it didn't have room for any more bodies. 
Again, none of these shootings involved cops, not one. Young black men in Chicago or Baltimore or St. Louis may indeed leave the house every day worrying about getting shot, but not by a cop. And will reducing police resources really solve this problem? And moreover, is that what people who live in high crime neighborhoods really want? Fewer police? Last year, there was a ballot measure put to voters in Minneapolis where George Floyd was killed. The ballot measure would have defunded the police if it passed. Not only was it defeated, it was most strongly opposed by black residents in high crime areas of Minneapolis who wanted more policing, not less. And the black residents of Minneapolis are not outliers here, they're typical. In a Gallup poll released in 2020, 81% of blacks nationwide said they wanted more police presence in their neighborhood. 81%. Another Gallup poll released a year earlier asked Black and Hispanic residents, low-income neighborhoods in particular, about police. 60% of both Blacks and Hispanics said they wanted police to spend more time in their communities. In 2015, after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, a poll found that a majority of Black residents said police treat them fairly and far more blacks than whites, by a two to one margin in fact, said they quote, want a greater police presence in their local neighborhoods. Nor is this a recent phenomenon. Crime control has been a priority of blacks for a long time in this country. In 1993, a Gallup poll found that 82% of black residents, respondents to the poll, said the criminal justice system doesn't treat criminals harshly enough. 75% of Blacks wanted more cops on the street to combat crimes, and 68% said we ought to build more prisons so that more sentences can be given. These efforts to defund the police are being pushed by activists and liberal elites who claim to be speaking on behalf of low-income minorities. But as the polling shows, they are mostly speaking for themselves. This is something Paul pointed out a long, long time ago. In the course of doing research for the book, I went through dozens and dozens of interviews that Sol had done over the decades. He would often be asked, how does it feel to go against the grain of so many other Blacks? And Sol would inevitably correct the premise of the question. You don't mean I go against the grain of most Blacks, he would say. You mean I go against the grain of most black intellectuals, most black elites. But black intellectuals don't represent most blacks any more than white intellectuals represent most whites, he would say. And this continues to be the case today. Most blacks, for example, support voter ID laws and school choice. While most black elites, your academics, your NAACP, your Black Lives Matter activists and so forth, oppose those things. Conversely, most Blacks oppose racial preferences in college admissions. And as I just mentioned, oppose defunding the police. While Black elites favor those things. Sol pointed out these disparities decades ago, and they've only grown since then. His writings on intellectual history have stressed time and again that intellectuals are a special interest group with their own self-serving agenda and priorities and ought to be understood as such. Liberal elites control the media by and large. They control academia by and large. They run the foundations that hand out intellectual awards and prizes. And Seoul has refused to play footsie with them, refused to pull his punches. And it has cost him. It has cost him in terms of prestige. It's cost him in terms of notoriety. He has paid a price. It's one of the reasons he is not as well known as the, those individuals I mentioned earlier. But I often tell people, if you think Ta-Nehisi Coates and Nicole Hannah-Jones represent the views of most black people, 
you need to get to know more black people. Has been right about this stuff for a very, very long time. So why does Tom Sowell still matter? Well, here's why. Sowell is now 90 years old. The book he published in 2020, as I mentioned, was book number 36 and his fifth since turning 80. That's not too bad for a black orphan from the Jim Crow South who was born into extreme poverty during the Great Depression, never finished high school, who didn't earn a college degree until he was 28 years old, and who didn't write his first book until he was 40. But even aside from that impressive personal journey, Soul is a rare species. He's an honest intellectual. He's someone who has consistently sought out the truth, regardless of whether it made him popular. He's been willing to follow the facts and the evidence wherever they lead, even when they lead to politically incorrect results. It's not something that ought to distinguish you as a scholar, but these days it does. Think about the current debate we're having over critical race theory, which really amounts to a, a fancy argument for racial preferences. These ideas were once relegated to college seminars. Now they are entering our workplaces through diversity training, and they're entering our elementary schools through the New York Times 1619 Project, which attempts to put the institution of slavery at the center of America's founding which is absurd. Slavery existed for thousands of years in societies all over the world long before the founding of the United States. More African slaves were sent to the Islamic world than were ever sent to the Americas. Slavery still exists today in places like Sudan, parts of Nigeria. What makes America unique is not slavery, it's emancipation. It's how fast we went from slavery to Martin Luther King to a black president. The economic and social progress of black Americans in only a few generations is something historians have described as unmatched in recorded history. That's what distinguishes America. These facts about slavery are well known among serious historians, but where are these serious historians today? A few have come forward, people like Sean Wilentz and Gordon Wood, and James McPherson and some others come to mind, but why so relatively few? Why isn't the head of every history department at every major university pushing back against the 1619 Project nonsense being peddled by the New York Times and Nicole Hannah-Jones, and now infiltrating our K through 12 school system? The nation's top scholars ought to be falling over one another, denouncing this stuff. Why have they been so relatively quiet? There have been countless books written by serious scholars about our nation's founding. And none of those books were written by Nicole Hannah-Jones. Why are serious historians so afraid to take on a journalist who's never written a single academic paper about anything, let alone about the history of slavery and the nation's founding. The reason they are so afraid of her is because taking her on politically incorrect will be called racist, will be called sexist. They could be platformed. It might damage their academic careers. This is the sort of intellectual cowardice that makes soul's life and work unique. Courage. This is what distinguishes his scholarship. Soul wasn't afraid. It's the sort of thing that ought to be commonplace among scholars and intellectuals and journalists for that matter. But clearly it is not. Soul has spent a career putting truth above popularity. And I think we need a hundred more just like him. Thank you.
I think we have some time for the questions. Or Ernie, do you want this? If anybody has any, any questions or, or comments as we come across uh, Mr. Riley, um, it's been an honor to uh, talk to you. I've seen you multiple times uh, on TV and on the Wall Street Journal. So it's truly an honor to listen to you talk about um, Dr. Soul. Um, one of the things that, uh, that you mentioned tonight is about how well known he is uh, around the country and the world. And, and it's truly amazing how multiple people um, here in Wichita that I, I tried to get them interested in coming tonight and had not heard about him. Um, and it just, um, it was surprising to me, but um, um, not too long ago, I heard Candace Owens, uh, maybe a, two or three years ago, talk about how much she respects him mm -hmm. and how she would love to interview him and I haven't seen any any interviews come uh, from her with with him. And I, I I do feel that there's a need for people to know him and, and know more about him. Um, and I think the means are there because Candace Owens is probably the best known black conservative in, in today's world, and and she's uh, even connected with people like Kanye West, who is uh, from, from the pop culture standpoint, someone who, who could allow this, this character to be a, a lot more known around the world. So um, since you know him, do you know why he is not out there and letting um, the world know him better? It's because he's 92 years old. Correct. <laughs> No, I, I, I understand in the, in the that. The 1970s but... and 80s and yeah. 90s, Soul was quite active. It's on the lecture circuit. Um, he did tons of interviews. Many of them yeah. can be found on YouTube. Correct. Now he's 92 years yeah. old. He's slowed down a little bit. Yeah. And I think he's letting a scholarship speak for itself. Right okay. Now. By the way, I, 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 I truly, uh, one of the, the ways that I, I got to know him um, about him was through YouTube and watching his interviews with, with Peter at the Hoover Institute in Stanford. So to whoever yeah. that haven't seen those interviews, I highly recommend those. Uh, they're fantastic. Thank you. Hey, hey, Jason, it's great to see you. I know a couple of your, I'm a friendly acquaintance of Dan Henninger's and I, I've met Ken Strassel a few times and I'm a really good friend of your former colleague, uh, Steve Moore. So uh, it's, I, I love your column and I like your love your work and I love Thomas Sowell and I'm so glad you wrote this. But uh, why is it, Hayek talked about, wrote about this in the 30s, I believe. It, and I think even Bastiat talked about it in the 1830s uh, about the, how why the intellectual class kills that which makes them possible. And as Thomas Sowell also has written, as you mentioned, uh, what is it about that 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 small my minority of people that wants to kill well, that which makes it possible? Awesome. Um, I, I think intellectual. Uh, free, free market economics, um, uh, you know, I guess starting with Adam Smith and, and, and his development over the, 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 the centuries that followed, um, demonstrated less and less need for intellectuals. They've been in self-preservation mode ever since. When, I mean, the idea of a, of a, of a market economy um, um, uh, self equilibrating. Um, the lack of need for experts to say we need so much of this produced at this price to go here, so much of this produced at that price to go there. Once it was decided that that was not only um, impossible for 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 human beings, even very very smart human beings, to figure out, um, but that it was incredibly inefficient. Once Adam Smith and, 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 and his intellectual descendants proved this, 
the classical liberal school. I mean, it really showed that there was less and less need for um, uh, these individuals and that intellectual class that um, prior to that had taken on a much far more important role in, in, the, in, the, in the functioning of the economy. Um, so, so I think that is, that is part of it. The, they become less and less relevant. And so what you're seeing is a sort of desperation to stay, to stay relevant uh, because uh, by, by fomenting you know, distrust in the free market and its efficiencies and what it can do to produce um, you know, more prosperity. If, uh, thank you again for your words and wisdom. Uh, very interesting talk. Your points on the elites that you were talking about, could you expound on their agenda? What drives their agenda? What's going to be their end point? And how have they been so successful? Well, it, it depends on, on, on the topic. I mean, I, I was talking primarily about um, Black elites and their support for uh, affirmative action. And... Um, you know, affirmative action does have a history, not only in this country, but in other countries of helping people that were already better off, kept them even more uh, prosperous. And that's largely what it's done here. So racial preferences and affirmative action are sold as a way to help the poor. But in fact, uh, they tend to, to help blacks that are already better off to begin with. And the defenders of affirmative action tend to be blacks who are already better off to begin with as a result of that. Um, it's no accident that critical race theory came out of the academy. And it was put forward initially as an argument for making race and gender um, an academic qualification for hiring. Think about that. I mean, but this is this has long long been the case. I mean, if, if you go back and to um, an earlier period in the fifties, forties um, and fifties, when you had the NAACP fighting um, housing discrimination, they were fighting these covenant laws that existed that prevented blacks from moving into certain white neighborhoods and um, and buying homes there. The Supreme Court eventually declared this unconstitutional. But think about this. Why would Black people in the 1940s and 50s need an organization fighting for them to get into middle-class white neighborhoods? Who had the money to move in to the neighborhoods, even if it was legal for them to buy homes there? This was the NAACP, a middle-class organization, fighting for themselves to be able to move into these neighborhoods at a time when most Blacks we're nowhere near being in a position to buy a home in the first place, let alone move into a white neighborhood. So, so you can see the, the, the point here is that there's always been this chasm between the agenda of the elites and the agenda of the rank and file. But the elites have the access to the media. They're obviously well-spoken, more articulate. They can get their message out. And that message has, has oftentimes prevailed, even if it is wholly unrepresentative of the people they claim to be speaking on behalf of. And that continues to be the case today, by and large. Thank you so much for being here. What are Seoul's chances of winning the economics Nobel this year? <laughs> um, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think they're very. They're very high. Uh, uh, for the, for the, partly in part for the reasons I mentioned, um, he's, um, he's, he's, he's burned some bridges over the years in his writings. And uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the people he's, uh, he's gone after are still around. So I, I, don't think, I don't think there's any in danger of, of, of that happening, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. You know, but, but, but Seoul, that's not something Seoul, you know, from, from everything I've learned about him, not only his writings, but in my personal interactions with him, that sort of recognition is the last thing on his mind. You know, Seoul's best-selling book is a book titled Basic Economics. It's been translated into 
seven or eight different languages. Um, um, it's in its fifth edition. And all it is, is a book, um, it's an economics textbook without any jargon and graphs and equations in it. That's all it is. And he's very proud of that book. I mentioned that Sol had studied under Friedman at the University of Chicago. Um, and some of you might recall that after Friedman left teaching, after he won his Nobel, um, he began to write these popular books about economics, capitalism and freedom, free to choose. He did television shows, documentary films. He lectured wisely, explaining economics to everyday people. And I think Sol took something uh, from Friedman in that regard. He's very, very concerned about economic literacy in this country. He thinks it's extremely important. He thinks that uh, intellectuals in general and economists in particular should not sit around talking to one another exclusively. They should be out there explaining their, 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 their discipline to everyday people. And that's really what Sol's concern has been. Uh, the vast majority of his books are not written for his fellow economists or fellow intellectuals, although he's written a, a number of those as well. The vast majority of his books are written for everyday people and it's really about explaining economic literacy. And that's been his goal, not to win these, these uh, Typhoon Luton prizes. I mean, I'm sure he take it and the money, but, um, but it's not something I think he sits that keeps him up at night. Thank you for being here. I appreciate your candor and your comments in the journal editorial report. Uh, you probably don't want to speak about yourself, but I'm curious, uh, your background, what led you to have a different perspective than, uh, than uh, other guys? <laughs> well, well, as I, uh, my views on a lot of issues, a lot of what I, what I write about um, are, are not that different from everyday blacks. You'd never know that from watching the media because as I've said, what you're hearing is not particularly represented. I, sus I support school choice. So do the vast, vast majority of black people. I'm fine with voter ID laws. So are a vast majority of black people and white people and Asians and Democrats and Republicans and conservatives and liberals. You'd never know that listening to the news, but support for voter ID laws in this country is, is wide and deep. Um, I, I mentioned school choice, affirmative action in higher education. Poll after poll after poll shows an absolute majority of blacks and whites and Asians opposing racial preferences in college admissions. Again, you'd never know that listening to the mainstream media, but that is the reality. So uh, it gets back to what Sol was saying, this, this idea that, um, that, that, that people who, who, who think and say these quote unquote conservative things are, are unrepresentative of the black rank and file. I, I just take issue with the premise. Um, uh, I, I, I don't think that a, a lot of the views I express are really outside the mainstream. I mean, I go and give talks like this um, at HBCUs. I, I've, give them, I've given them in front of groups of you know, religious blacks, black ministers and, and so forth. And completely unfazed by talks you know, speaking about personal responsibility, the, pro the problem being criminals, not police. Th th these, this is commonsensical conversation in, 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 uh, before most black groups. Um, I give a talk like this, the first question I get will be, thank you for your talk, Mr. Riley. How do I get a job at the Wall Street Journal? Literally, I mean, that, the rest of it is completely, it's, it's so um, it, it I know it's hard, but you 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 ha you have to appreciate to what extent there is this disconnect between what um, the Black Lives Matter folks are saying, what the NAACP is saying, what a lot of these black politicians are saying. You know, Barack Obama spent eight years in office to shut down a voucher program in Washington D.C. that is overwhelmingly supported by D.C. residents um, um, who are black and by um, uh, most Americans, most black Americans. Yet he spent eight years trying to shut this program down. Why? Not because it's not among blacks, but because it's not popular among the teachers unions and he gets a lot of money from the teachers unions. The NAACP today is opposed to charter schools. 
They're supposed to represent the interests of blacks. They oppose charter schools. Find me a poll that shows less than 50% of blacks supporting charter schools. Hell, less than 60% or 70%. It'd be very hard to do. Yet the NAACP opposes charter schools. Why? They get a lot of funding from the teachers unions and the teachers unions oppose charter schools. So, you know, it's, um, you have to be careful when, when people try and present the quote unquote black point of view and make sure that they, um, that they do in fact um, hold that the, the correct position. I, I have a question. Uh, long time caller, long time listener. What has been the reaction to your book and what are your thoughts about the reaction to your book? Which book? The one on your biography of- biography. Uh, it's, it's been quite favorable actually. Um, and I should mention, I, I did um, in conjunction with the book, I narrated uh, a documentary film about Seoul for public television. And it came out uh, around the same time, it came out within a few months of one another. And um, one of the reasons I wanted to write the book was to introduce him to a, a younger generation of, um, of readers. Um, and I think there's been some success on that front, uh, particularly with the documentary, because it's, it, it was not only after it was available on uh, public television stations, uh, then it became available to stream. Amazon and, and um, YouTube and other places where they can track the, the demographics of who's streaming it. And what they found was that it was younger, trended younger. People in their 30s, uh, early 40s were the ones uh, streaming the documentary. So, um, so I was very encouraged by that. Uh, the other thing that, that uh, makes me optimistic is um, uh, Seoul has a, uh, a fan account on Twitter. Sol's not on social media himself, but a guy who's a fan, who's never met Tom, never had any interaction with him, decided to start a fan account a few years ago. Um, and all he does is post direct quotations from Sol's books and columns. No added commentary. He just posts direct quotes. That, that fan account, I think, has close to a million followers. And um, I interviewed the guy for the book. He wanted to remain anonymous. He said it might get him in trouble at work or something if people found out he was a fan of soul. But um, um, it, it's, and, and of course, you know who's on social media, they tend to be younger people. So I, I, I'm convinced that, um, that we're reaching a, a, younger, a younger audience with his work. And I'm very, uh, I'm very happy about that. Yeah. yeah. So I have, a, I have one quick question back here. Sure. I think I know the answer to this after you spoke about Obama and the charter schools, but why is it so difficult to get photo ID passed through Congress? And there's so much controversy. On oh, I, I, I personally don't think Congress should be, I don't want Congress to do anything. The, 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 this is a state issue and it has passed in a number of states. Um, um, and the Supreme Court has uh, blessed voter ID laws. Um, so I, I think it's a, it should be on a state-by-state -state basis if, if that's what states wanna do. Um, if, if there is an effort in Congress right now to get involved in that, and it would reverse them. It would, you know, the Congress, Democrats get the numbers they want in November. One of the first things they're gonna do is start uh, interfering in, in in state and local uh, procedures, and um, and and uh, and that's not what I think we want. I think this is a federalism issue that should stay with the states. And uh, th 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 this is such a it's such a, a phony controversy. There's the whole voter suppression in in in. Um, in, in 2008, um, voter turnout in the country, the black voter turnout rate was higher than the white voter turnout rate. 
in 2008 and 2012. Okay. Um, in 2016, uh, it dipped somewhat, but only to the pre-Obama level. Um, you know, it didn't fall off of a cliff. It just went back to where it was before you had a black uh, presidential candidate on the ballot. Uh, and then in 2020, it rose again to the third highest in recorded history after 2008 and 2012. So you, so, <laughs> I mean, so we've been having this debate about voter suppression in a country where the trajectory of black voter participation has been going like this since the mid nineties and has in three of the past four presidential elections set records. It's, 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 it's a completely phony Debate if your measure of black voter suppression is actual black voter turnout. If, if Republicans are suppressing the black vote, they are doing a horrible job of it, is the bottom line. A horrible job of it as measured by black voter turnout. But here we are. Yes. The, there's an intersection, of course, with race and income inequality. But looking at the piece from Phil Graham recently, looking at income equality based on um, welfare and tax credits. Uh, what do you think and what do you think Thomas's uh, comments would be on the pros and the cons of this income equality yet seen as an inequality in America? Do you, do you know what I'm not sure I follow those? Oh, so in the, in the Wall Street Journal, maybe a, three weeks ago, Phil Graham did a piece on how if you're in the bottom 25%, you're pretty much living like you would live in. I'm, 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 I'm familiar with the piece. My under, my reading of it was that um, Graham's written a book about this. Um, and he's saying that uh, our, our, our measure of U.S. poverty does not take into account um, in-kind benefits that the poor receive. It's just cash benefits to the state. And, 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 and that's why it looks like there's a far bigger gap than there actually is. Correct. If you count what the poor receive in in-kind benefits, uh, tax credits and so forth, um, the poverty, uh, the, the, the level of inequality is, is not nearly as wide uh, as the official measure. And so he's, he's, he's taking issue with how to measure this. But I'm not sure what your question, question is. is so uh, I, I agree with him on that, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Clearly, it's it's a poor incentive if you have, you know, in the bottom quintile, most people are not working, yet in the top, that top quintile, people are 90 some percent are working hard. Uh, so how do you, and I was saying that, you know, there's this race and any income inequality issue in America, which there is because, uh, the, the, the average income, I would say, is somewhere in the ten and fourteen, fifteen thousand dollar mark for an individual. What would be the economic incentives that Thomas would say to get us out of that rut? Well, I, I would think they would look at at history. I mean, we went through a a, a period of welfare reform in the mid nineties, and um, I think on balance it was quite successful. Um, we saw poverty rates fall. And they fell particularly for uh, single moms, the most vulnerable group. And what was part of that reform? Uh, work incentives. Um, it, the problem, what, what led to the welfare reform in the first place was we had reached a point where it made perfect economic sense for someone to stay home and collect welfare because they could never earn enough money in the labor force uh, they would never earn more in the labor force than they were getting by staying home. And welfare reform is supposed to correct that problem. And it did to a large extent, though we've been creeping back in that direction. Um, uh, every time there's a recession, we had COVID, they watered down work requirements, they uh, 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 government payments to, uh, to, to, to low income people. Uh, and then they, they, they call them emergency measures, but they never end the emergency. And so we, we've crept back to where we were before the, uh, the 96 reform. I don't think we're quite there yet, but we've certainly moved in that direction. But, but the bottom line is that incentives matter. Um, and, and if you're going to incentivize people not to work, 
uh, if you're going to tell them, if you're going to suspend rent payments, if you're going to cancel student debt, um, it, it, you're giving them incentives and, and people respond to incentives. And so you have to change the incentives. Yeah. So what did that, what did the good incentives get out of that rush? That's what the I threat of losing oh, your benefits. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the, the biggest incentive at all. That, that there's no alternative to, if you're an able-bodied individual, and, and what is the unemployment rate in Kansas? Four three four percent. What what excuse do you? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Hi, sir. I had a question about the use of Thomas Sowell and Candace Owens by white conservatives, particularly in our society. Uh, Conservatives and a lot of other people like Thomas Sowell, rightfully so. They like Candace Owens, rightfully so. They speak the truth. But it seems like the conservatives like them because they can speak the truth about race and other related subjects that mere white people aren't allowed to speak about. So we love it when, oh, we love Thomas Sowell. He speaks the truth. Well, why don't you speak the truth, white person, and stand up? Don't, don't hide behind Thomas Sowell or hide behind Candace Owens or, or other people. Well, in a certain sense, we're sort of exploiting or, or using Thomas Sowell and Candace Owens to, so, to get them to do our, not dirty work, but what we're afraid to do ourselves. Well, first, I'm, 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 I'm reluctant to use Thomas, the names Thomas Sowell and Candace Owens interchangeably. <laughs> I think there's a... <laughs> there's a slight, slight difference there in... Uh, um, I, I, you know, I, I don't have anything against Candace Owens, um, but she's much more of a political activist, um, a Republican activist, um, uh, uh, than Thomas, than Thomas Sowell is. Um, and I don't think, uh, I don't think Candace Owens would deny, would deny that. Um, um, I think, uh, there's some truth to what you're saying that, um, uh, there are white conservatives who um, don't like being called racist and like to be able to point to uh, blacks who share their beliefs uh, as a shield against that racism charge. And I think that's human, that's human nature. Um, but this is the game that the left plays. This is identity politics. This is, um, you know, ethnic and racial determinism. At work, uh, and I kind of understand that response on the right. Uh, if, if this is the the game that the left plays, if 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 only people, if, if you're a, if if the left say, um, you know, only only blacks are only allowed to hold certain views, or that uh, any white person who holds a certain view must be a racist. I think it's perfectly natural for that white person to say, well, wait, what about this? This person isn't white and they hold this view. This person's Asian and they hold the same view. Why are you saying that the only people that hold these views? I mean, I, I, I think that's a defense mechanism. I think it's unfortunate that that's where we are, but um, um, but that's that's just the reality. I think I don't. I think it's hard to fault people for for um, for responding in the way they respond. Perhaps, perhaps. I have a quick question. So you, you pointed out in the very beginning the importance of an intellectual debate, which obviously I agree with. And you talked about how or why historians, for example, professors, experts in their field, don't shout down or challenge, you know, when, you know, propaganda is presented like the, it's the 1619 project. Is that what it's called? The 1619 project. So just as an example. So in your world and, and as you span media, et cetera, do you see any movement where subject matter experts are willing to push back or are starting to push back because obviously that's really what's warranted is the is a political debate on the truth or what is the truth or or some version of that i i think um more broadly you're getting pushback um not as much as i'd like to see but that the pendulum has swung too far I mean, you're at a point now where you have progressives calling math racist, calling punctuality white supremacy, 
And I think there are some people that, wait a minute. No, wait, wait, hold on. Um, uh, again, not enough, but that, that is starting to happen. I think the left is, might have overplayed their hand in, in some form. And, and I think the calculation that was being made on the left was, um, uh, at least in, in, in recent years, is they thought they could leverage Trump's unpopularity to promote progressive causes. And they're learning that not liking Trump is not the equivalent of supporting far left policies. Just because uh, uh, a, a group of people or individuals say, um, I don't care for Donald Trump, doesn't mean they're for uh, 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 forgiving student loan debts. Um, um, you know, or or progressive taxation rates and so forth, but but the, but the the Democrats thought that they could leverage that that unpopularity, and I think they are seeing some backlash. Yes, having having retired from thirty years in education here in the Wichita Public Schools, it seems to me there's a common denominator that students are effectively taught when they have parents. <laughs> who are down their throats, making sure they're taking care of business. And it seems like we see you know, the suburbs do well with education. We see wealthy people send their kids to wealthy people's schools. When you say charter schools, certainly that's a good alternative and it, it has worked. Certainly it's taken Herculean efforts to make that happen because of opposition by unions and other factors, cost. But my question to you is, is there any way to save the public schools because there are so many students involved in the public schools, we certainly can't shift perhaps just to charter schools. What do you say to the idea of improving the public schools? Well, the question is how to do that. And I agree that um, the goal shouldn't be to um, scale up charter schools to the point where they entirely replace traditional public schools. I think that's unrealistic. What you want is uh, for, the, for the public schools to face competition. And that can come from charters, that can come from religious schools, that can come from tax credit programs, that can come from voucher programs. I, I, but it's, it could come from homeschooling. But the point is uh, to create competition and that that will be the incentive for the schools to improve. I was talking to someone earlier and I said, I always use the analogy though, of the post office, um, where a lot of us are old enough to remember when the post office was much worse than it is today. And, and why is it better today? It's not because the post office held a meeting one day and decided we're gonna get our act together. It was Federal Express, it was UPS, it was, they had competition. And I think similarly, that's what you're going to have to, to see. And the other thing to remember is, uh, and, and can be lost in some of these school reform debates, is um, you know what's going on at 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 home uh, before these kids show up at at, at school. Um, uh, you know, there have been, for instance, some very interesting studies done on word counts. So the, the the number of words that a child hears. Uh, based on their class. So a, um, uh, a child of, of, of professional parents, doctors, lawyers, might hear something like 2,400 words per hour at home. Uh, um, a working class uh, mechanic, plumber, as uh, children might hear something like 1,200 words, half of that. And a child of, of someone on welfare might, might hear like 600 words an hour. Uh, may not seem like a huge, huge difference, but over time, what that means is that um, by the time a child on welfare is 10 years old, they will not have heard as many words as a three-year-old child of professionals. And you know, that's what's showing up at school for the teachers to deal with. And that's something um, that's going to be a challenge. I think we have the, uh, the education models out there to deal with it. I think we've shown that, but we should keep in mind that there are things happening outside of the schools that, um, that the schools have to deal with. And, and, you, and you look at something like that word count and you see this, and, and you see calls to eliminate the SAT because it's racist. 
what if just on that word count data alone, why would you expect this, this disparity to be erased by the time that kid sits down at age 17 to take the SAT? It's, it's absurd. Or think that with a few remedial classes freshman year, you'll fix the problem if you just let them into the school. It's, it's, it's completely unrealistic. And uh, so these calls and, and, and getting rid of the SAT isn't going to get rid of the gap. It's just going to obscure the gap. Um, it's not going to close. Uh, uh, so, but but we should, I think, keep in mind um, uh, these other factors when we talk about education reform. I'm not unsympathetic to what else is going on here. Back here, as you, uh, yes or no, quick. If you could wave a magic wand, what public policy, what law would you most like to see changed? We've talked about several tonight. What keeps you up at night? Uh, I think the schooling. I, I really think that um, um, education is is the ticket. And um, in, in a free market society, I think we've seen that historically. And I, the fact that these kids are trapped in, in failing schools and don't have the options, uh, even though we have the education models out there to serve them, is uh is something i would i would focus on fixing on on day one yeah yeah thank you thank you thank you thank you well, once again i wanted to thank everybody for coming out and if you get a chance uh you know, we have those sheets there that you can put your name and your email address if you're not already on our list. And uh, we appreciate you coming out tonight. Thank you very much.